Welcome to the Titanic VR guided tour. We are currently 3.8 kilometers below the surface of the North Atlantic and 100 meters east of the bow. This submersible is on autopilot. However, you can adjust your spotlight using the far left lever. Please keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. I'll provide you with information about locations as we pass them, so please sit back, relax and enjoy the ride. The RMS Titanic was the second White Star Line Olympic class ocean liner, the first being RMS Olympic and the third being HMHS Britannic. She was 269 metres long, 28 metres wide and 72 metres tall from the bottom of her keel to the top of her masts. At 46,328 tonnes, she was the largest ship built at the time, being only slightly bigger than Olympic. She would be servicing the transatlantic route, a journey from Southampton, England to New York, USA. She stops at Cherbourg, France and Queenstown, Ireland. After departing Queenstown on the afternoon of Thursday, the 11th of April, RMS Titanic began her 5,360 kilometre journey to New York City. She was due to arrive in the early hours of Wednesday the 17th of April, but with calm ocean conditions and good weather, it was possible she could arrive early on Tuesday evening instead. The night of the 14th of April was moonless and a light fog was developing on the horizon. Titanic's captain, Edward Smith, had received a number of ice warnings during the day and had changed their course so they were further south to avoid the affected areas. The captain retired to bed and First Officer William Murdoch took charge of the bridge as officer of the watch. Titanic steamed ahead until 11.40pm when the lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee spotted an iceberg directly ahead. Fleet rang the warning bell three times to indicate an obstacle ahead and phoned the bridge. Murdoch gave the order, hard a starboard, and the ship turned to port, but it was too late. Titanic struck the iceberg on her starboard side. The impact buckled hull plates and sheared rivets, revealing her first six compartments to the ocean. As the iceberg slid down the side of the ship, Murdoch ordered a hard a port, swinging a Titanic stern out of the path of the iceberg. He also closed the watertight doors, isolating the flooding to those damaged compartments. The forward three hatches, along with the peak tank and boiler rooms five and six were breached. After the collision, RMS Titanic stopped and almost immediately took a starboard list. The captain organized a group to inspect the damage and ordered the carpenter, John Maxwell, to sound the ship. Chief designer, Thomas Andrews, knew the volume of each breached compartment and calculated that the initial flooding rate was around 15,000 tonnes within the first 40 minutes. With this information, he estimated Titanic would sink within 90 minutes. He then informed the captain, who then ordered the officers to begin preparing the lifeboats. All free seamen were sent up to the boat deck to begin pulling the covers off the lifeboats and to collect lanterns, blankets, food and water for the passengers. Passengers were woken by their stewards and told to put on their life belts and head up to the boat deck. Titanic carried just 20 lifeboats, four more than required by the regulations outlined by the British Board of Trade. There were 14 regular wooden lifeboats, two smaller cutters and four Engelhardt collapsible boats. The total capacity of these lifeboats was only 1,178 people, far less than the total on board. This fact must have weighed heavily on the captain's mind, as he specified the boats to be filled with women and children first. Just over an hour after the collision, the first lifeboat left the sinking ship. To convince women to leave, officers tried assuring them it was only a precaution that they would be back on board by daylight. First Officer Murdoch filled the starboard side, while Second Officer Charles Lightoller filled port. The officers interpreted the captain's women and children first order differently, with Murdoch putting men into the boats after all the women and children near the boat had entered. 
Light Holler, on the other hand, only allowed women and children to enter the boats and refused all men and boys over 14 years old. By 1.45 am, Titanic was down by about 5 degrees to the head, with the forecastle almost underwater. Panic began to rise through the passengers still on deck as they watched boat after boat launch. A few male passengers were physically removed from stern portside lifeboats 14 and 16, and 5th officer Harold Lowe warned other men not to approach by firing his pistol into the water below. The situation at the starboard bow was similar, with a group of men storming collapsible sea. Murdoch fired his pistol twice to warn them to move back from the lifeboat, and they were dragged out by other male passengers. A large group of third-class women and children took their place, along with a few seamen and the owner of White Star Line, Joseph Bruce Ismay. In the radio room, Titanic's Marconi operators were desperately communicating with nearby stations and ships. Throughout the night, senior operator Jack Phillips worked the 5 kilowatt Marconi wireless radio set to send out distress signals using both the old CQD and new SOS call codes. He alerted nearby ships to their position and status and received updates of ship locations and estimated arrival times. Junior operator Harold Bride took these updates to Captain Smith and passed the captain's responses back to Phillips for transmission. RMS Carpathia radio operator Harold Cotton was off duty and about to go to bed when he decided to listen in to the nightly news from Cape Cod. Operators there mentioned they had ice warnings for Titanic and Cotton decided to pass on the message. He was surprised when Phillips responded to his call with a CQD and gave Titanic's location. Cotton immediately took the message to Carpathia's captain, Arthur Rostron, who ordered all hands on deck and told Cotton to let Titanic know they were on their way 